Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, thank you for joining us for what I'm sure is going to be a really, really interesting webinar. Uh, my name is Emma Gildeskame at the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. Uh, and this webinar is part of our National 303D TMDL webinar series supported by the EPA. Uh, we've been hosting these since 2016, uh, and we hope to continue to host them for quite a while. Um, all previous webinars are available on our website. Uh, the link to that will be in uh, the email you receive after this, and also there'll be several links to it on uh, this webinar. Just a few go-to webinar notes for those who may not be familiar with it. Uh, everybody except for our presenters are on mute, uh, but there is still ways to uh, participate in the conversation. Uh, if you look in your GoToWebinar toolbar, there's a tab called Chat, uh, and you have an option to send a question to staff. I'll be looking at those questions throughout the webinar and we'll uh, ask them of our presenters at the end. Uh, so whenever you think of them, send in a question. Um, and then if you have technical difficulties or anything else going on, there's also a window, uh, you can see it in the pink circle on your screen right now, uh, of what that icon looks like to raise your hand and I can message you directly to help figure out what's going on. Also, GoToWebinar has some great online tools, so it might also be worth a quick Google uh, to see uh, if they have an answer to your question. Um, after the webinar, uh, you'll be prompted to have a, to answer a short survey. We read every single one of these. I read every single one of these, and the planning team and I use them to help shape the future of the webinar. So please fill this out. There will also be an opportunity in the follow-up email uh, to answer the same questions. So please, please, please tell us what you thought of the webinar. Tell us what topics you'd like to see in the future. Uh, we, again, really use these to shape the future of this webinar series. Speaking of the future of this webinar series, we are starting 2020 with something new. Uh, coming soon to the New APIC website, uh, we will be uh, accepting applications. So if you have an idea of something that you would like to present for this series, which is really targeted towards people working on water quality impairments, the 303D list, TMDLs, uh, some of the priority topics are listed on your screen right now. We do have some funding available for some applicants. Uh, because of our funding, we can't offer, fun offer funding to everybody, but uh, we'll have eligibility information once that application goes live on our website, which should be at some point this month. Um, if you know this is something that you're interested in, shoot me an email at the email address on your screen, and I will make sure to get you that information as soon as we have it finalized. Uh, and we'll be reviewing these quarterly uh, and uh, scheduling webinars accordingly. So stay tuned. We're really excited about this and we're excited to see all the ideas that you all bring to us. Uh, after the webinar, uh, you may want to learn more. We have every single webinar that we've done in this series is live on our website. Uh, so you can watch recordings and often download some supporting materials. Uh, our website is linked there. It'll also be in your follow-up email. Um, we have these going back to 2016. Lots of cool stuff going on. And today's cool stuff, uh, I'm really excited for our three great presenters today. Um, they, two of them have worked with the Mass Statewide uh, Municipal Stormwater Coalition. Uh, and then we have one who has done really similar work and worked with them uh, from Maine. So first we'll hear from Carrie Reed. She is the Senior Stormwater and Environmental Engineer for the City of Framingham, Mass, Department of Public Works. She serves as the Chair of the Massachusetts Statewide Municipal Stormwater Coalition. She's a registered professional engineer in Massachusetts, an Army veteran, mother of two amazing boys, and a Patriots fan. Uh, we will also hear from Allie Cliff, the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Cumberland County, Maine Soil and Water Conservation District. She implements the MS4 Minimum Control Measures for Public Education, Outreach and Participation for 14 municipalities, 
uh, two MS4 communities that make up the Interlocal Stormwater Working Group in Maine. Uh, Allie also coordinates with the other Maine MS4 working groups to implement the Think Blue Maine program. Um, we're excited for all of this, and I will hand things over to Carrie right now. So thank you, everybody, and give a warm, if silent, welcome to our presenters. Bye. Right. Thanks, Emma. All right. So hopefully everybody can see what I'm seeing right now. Um, so thanks, thanks everybody for joining. We're really excited to talk to you about um, what we've been doing with the Think Blue campaign. So first we wanted to start off um, just so you can put some faces to our voices and see our smiling faces. Um, Emma thankfully did a nice introductory uh, introduction of us, so I don't have to keep going on, but here we are and we'll have our contact information at the end if you guys have any follow-up questions. And we also wanted to um, say thank you to the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. They were the organization that provided us the grants that enabled us to do the Think Blue Massachusetts work. So we definitely want to say thank you before we got going. Without that funding, we wouldn't have been able to do this project. Okay. So today, as we talked about, we're going to talk to you a little bit about um, how we got to Think Blue and how we got to the doc. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about that. And then Allie's going to talk to you about Think Blue Maine and that program and kind of how it's set up, um, what they've done, and what they're working on. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about the Think Blue Massachusetts program, why we chose that one, what we did, and where you can find all the materials. And then we'll have question and answer at the end. So, um, big question is, where did this come from? How did it start? And um, none of this information is new to anybody. Uh, what we discovered is that the municipalities in Massachusetts are dealing with the same thing as Maine, as in New England, as across the United States. Um, we're all competing for the same pot of money from the taxpayers to do the work that we need to do. We're all a little bit overwhelmed by all the permit requirements and, and concerned about me meeting those regulatory requirements. Um, we have a lot of very technical folks and great administrators working on, on this, but it's really spread and diverse. And then the last thing is that the general public really doesn't quite understand stormwater yet. Um, so one of our challenges in Massachusetts as this new permit was looming on there was um, when we go back to our public and ask them for funding for like a fire truck. They can totally wrap their head around that, understand that, and understand the value. But when we're asking for the same amount of funding for a stormwater BMP, for phosphorus removal, their eyes would start to glaze over and they just really didn't get it. And um, all of us in municipalities, you know, we're not marketing people. We weren't really, and I'm an engineer myself, so like trying to take these technical terms and put them into something that people could understand and really get behind was challenging. So we kept going back to the state and the EPA and said, we need help with this. You know, it's the same everywhere. We need a, a smoky bear. We need a McGrath crime dog. Um, we need help with this thing. We can do the real technical stuff, but we need help with this. So that's how we ended up with the duck. Um, so we were really, really challenged with how, how do we do this? And what we knew we wanted was something that was, could be like regionalized, statewide, something that everybody could understand that wasn't specific to our town, our county, our watershed. Um, we want something that could have brand recognition that people would like and identify with. We wanted to make sure we had a marketing strategy that worked. Um, and then the last thing we were looking for was something that we could have metrics so that we could do compliance with our permit, because that was what our concern was. So. We wanted to definitely have metrics that we could go back to the regulators and they have confidence in. So we started off, the, the duck started with Think Blue San Diego back in 2001. But what this did was show all of us that, you know, there could be this marketing logo brand that people looked at and got and understood the messaging and the duck was one of them. And then Think Blue Maine took that over in 2003 and, start, and they did some great work, which Ali will talk to you a little bit more about, um, where they actually had 
baseline data and metrics, and the regulators had confidence that this program worked. So in Massachusetts, when we were struggling, we said, why are we going to start from scratch? Let's work with something that we know is good. Um, and that's how we started incorporating the Think Blue um, logo and with us. And we're hoping that it will expand. Um, Think Blue New England is kind of our, our dream and um, across the state, because as you said, West Coast, East Coast, it seems to be working. And now I'm going to turn it over to Allie to talk to you a little bit about um, Think Blue Maine. Perfect. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so just to provide everybody some background about the main um, current MS4 permit requirements, because uh, there are some very key differences between Maine and Massachusetts in our permit language and requirements. Um, so we end up using the ThinkBlue program in very different capacities, although there are some similarities as well. So in Maine, our MS4 permit is issued by the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, we all operate, um, are currently operating under a continuation of the 2013 to 2018 permit, which means we're uh, currently in permit year seven of a five-year permit. So this existing permit that we have requires four education plans for the minimum control measure one of public education and outreach. And so we use the Think Blue Maine program to satisfy the stormwater awareness plan portion of the MCM1 requirement. Next slide, please, Carrie. So um, since Maine has 30 MS4 municipalities and eight nested MS4s, uh, we and all of those communities are kind of nested or clustered in certain regions of the state. We all operate um, in a stormwater working group. And so there are four in the state. The Androscoggin Valley Stormwater Working Group is located in the Lewis and Auburn area of Maine. The Bangor area Stormwater Working Group. The Interlocal Stormwater Working Group is the Greater Portland and Greater Saco area. And then the Southern Maine Stormwater Working Group is um, down around Kittery, so the Maine-New Hampshire border. Um, and so each of these stormwater working groups has a facilitator and each facilitator helps implement the education outreach efforts um, for the whole entire cluster. So all of the municipalities and nesteds within each cluster do the same education efforts. Um, and then the facilitators of those four groups coordinate amongst ourselves um, to implement the statewide Think Blue Maine program. Next slide, please, Carrie. So our current Think Blue Maine program, the one we have set up to meet the current permit requirements uh, for the stormwater awareness plan, is that we use the Think Blue Maine program to reach our target audience of homeowners ages 35 to 55. And through Think Blue Maine, we provide information to our target audience about stormwater pollutants they're likely to contribute to which would be household hazardous waste, vehicle care, pet waste, septic systems, pesticides and fertilizers, litter, erosion, and pavement sealers. And since the main stormwater working groups can submit um, those regional annual reports for minimum control measures one and two, all of the municipalities within a stormwater working group use the same materials with the Think Blue Main and then the cluster logo. Um, and then since we're all kind of working on very similar issues, uh, the clusters also share a lot of materials between ourselves. And for those kind of even more generic materials, they're just branded with the Think Blue Main logo. Next slide, please, Carrie. Uh, so with the current permit, we use the Think Blue Main program to do delivery of information a couple different ways. Um, the Think Blue Main program performs most of its outreach through print and digital media forms, our website and Facebook posts, and then through community events. And so when Maine started this permit cycle, we were running the ducky ads um, through a lot of cable TV, uh, which is the more traditional media outreach. But there have been a really big, strong shift in how everyone is consuming 
their entertainment. Um, and so we switched away from TV ads to social media ads on Facebook during um, this kind of permit continuance that we've been under. And there are two main reasons why. Uh, Facebook ads are a lot cheaper to run than uh, traditional media ads. And Facebook actually allows us to be really, really specific and who we want to reach with our uh, messages. Um, so we're able to target our audience really specifically with really good precision and really good analytics coming out the back end. Another reason why we chose Facebook as our kind of starting point is that 75% of our target audience uses Facebook. So it's a really good platform to reach them with the information that we want them to receive. Next slide, please, Carrie. So looking ahead, we are supposed to be getting a new permit very soon. Uh, we'll likely have a permit year eight before the next permit comes online. Um, but based on the draft language that we're seeing, uh, Maine is going to continue to need to do a general stormwater awareness campaign where we need to introduce information that may be new or not well understood by the target audience. And so we're going to continue using the Think Blue Maine program to uh, target the general public, which is defined in the permit this time around, um, and we're going to need to deliver the campaign using at least three outreach tools. Next slide, please, Carrie. And so looking ahead, the way that we're going to implement the Think Blue Main program to meet the new permit requirements is we're gonna focus on updating our current Think Blue Main website because it hasn't been um, really given a new look and some new content for a while. Um, we also want to change the website to be less text and more images. Um, and we want to also focus on creating more video content that's structured for social media use, which means um, aiming for those videos to be between five to 15 seconds long. Our ducky ads that we're using right now are about 30 seconds, which is kind of the sweet spot for those traditional um, TV ad spots, but they're actually <laughs> considered way too long for social media. So we wanna try to get um, some shorter videos for those types of platforms. And then we also wanna experiment with doing um, some field pieces and live streaming as well with those platforms. We want to look at expanding to other platforms to reach different demographics like YouTube and Instagram because there is a lot of research that certain um, age groups use totally different uh, social media platforms. So in order to expand our reach, we're going to need to also um, put our materials onto additional platforms. And then of course, we always want to have more face-to-face -face interactions with our residents and businesses. So we wanna focus on doing even more local events and increasing stormwater visibility in our communities. So I wanna thank everybody who tuned in. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to the Think Blue Massachusetts portion. All right. Thank you so much. So this is Carrie again. Um, and unfortunately, Eric can't make it, but I'm gonna try and do this part justice. So hopefully I get the, uh, the all the metrics very well. So the Think Blue Mass. Uh, Eric is having technical difficulties. We're trying to get him in. Can I ask you a question while we are uh, trying to get Eric's technical difficulties sorted out? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, so, the so the question is, um, how you kind of picked the audiences that, 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 that you targeted so far? Uh, I guess it's for Ali. Oh, no. Yes. Uh, um, so uh, some of our audiences were specified in the main MS4 permit, and then others they kind of left up to us. Um, and so the stormwater awareness uh, campaign is kind of the biggest overarching. So we tried to make that kind of our largest target audience, and then with our other um, our other 
campaigns and education plans, we started focusing on more specific um, audiences for those. So for instance, um, we had to do an enhanced outreach campaign. And for that, we focused on reaching legislature um, to help get a bill passed that would ban the use of coal tar, which actually just happened last year. So it's a little mix of the permit told us to and a little mix of um, the needs for our cluster. Right. And I will say for Massachusetts, same thing that we're really driven by the permit requirements. Um, we're at the beginning of our permit right now and we have a much broader base. So we try to focus on the audiences that were required for the majority of the permit holders, which was, um, and the ones that had the most uh, material available right now. So right now we're really focused on general um, residents and the general population. Um, and then as we move forward in our campaign, we're gonna start trying to focus a little bit more following Maine's model really on specific audiences targeting specific behavior and um, some of the additional requirements for outreach in our permit for impaired waters and TMDLs. Um, and I Eric's specifically, here. The, the most that we have is for like nitrogen and bacteria. All right. So it sounds like Eric made it. I'm on. I apologize for I'm having lots of technical difficulties here this afternoon. I'm just glad it wasn't me. <laughs> <sighs> no, it was me. So we were just um, starting to talk about Think Blue Massachusetts. Um, and I was starting to tell everybody about the uh, statewide coalition and kind of making the segue between how Maine structure their program and now how we basically stole a bunch of good ideas from Maine to structure our program. Um, so if you're ready, Eric, I can hand over the reins to you. So unfortunately, I still I only have audio access. I don't have access to the um, to the webinar itself. Okay. Well, then I can keep going and you can chime in. That'll work. I'm sorry about that. No worries. Um, so we have the slide up here right now. Um, the statewide coalition is just a bunch of cities and towns that we try to get together. Um, we represent the statewide coalition right now over 130 communities, which you'll notice is a big jump from Maine, which had a much smaller amount of communities that are in the program. Um, and we also, um, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this webinar, and we're very proud of this Think Blue Massachusetts program. We're very proud that we got this best formal idea in New England. And um, part of our coalition's mission is to share materials. Um, our whole thing is that we shouldn't all individually be trying to figure this stuff out on our own. Um, Stormwater is the same everywhere. You know, rain comes out of the sky. So we want to share ideas and help each other out. So our overview of the MS4 permit, um, comparing it to, to Maine and some other things, unlike many other states, um, our permit comes directly from EPA. So we're getting our regulations and our requirements directly from the federal government. We are in the second year of a permit. Um, I believe the last one got administratively extended for, I think it was a total of 16 years after the first five year um, period. So for many of us in Massachusetts, this is kind of eye-opening and um, it really forced us to look at our programs and to try to figure out what we were gonna do. So many of the cities and towns are feeling a little overwhelmed. And so anything that we could take off their plate was helpful. And this public awareness and public education thing seemed like an easy thing that could be done at a regional level to kind of help them out. Um, and as you know, this, the numbers are, are a little off, but um, so the statewide coalition doesn't represent every town and city that has a permit, although these materials are available across the entire state, but there's a lot of communities in Massachusetts that are trying to figure this all out. So the permit specifically says that we need to implement an education program that includes educational goals based on stormwater issues of significance within the MS4 area which is a very broad idea. It further goes on to say 
that we need to provide outreach for four specific audiences. One being residents, which as I mentioned before, is what we kind of start focusing on. The second, businesses, institutions, and commercial facilities. The third, developers, mostly the construction industry. And the last one was industrial facilities. Um, so I'm sure you're all kind of aware some messages overlap really, really well, and some do not. The permit goes on to say that you can use existing materials if they're appropriate, and that's why we look to see what was already out there instead of trying to create stuff our own and why the Think Blue campaign really appealed to us. The permit also says that you may partner with other MS4s, community groups, watershed associations to do this program. So we have a lot of different folks working together. Um, in some areas, in some regions, the watershed groups are really active and they take a larger role in doing the outreach. In other areas, it falls on the planning council, and in some areas, it goes right back to the towns and cities themselves. And then the last little tidbit is that um, you have to do two educational messages over the permit in each of the audiences spaced at least a year apart. So you can't front load or back load anything. The intent is to kind of have this continuing messaging so that it starts to sink in. And then the last piece of the MS4 permit requirements was that you have to show evidence of this focus message, evidence of the progress, and that your goals have been achieved. So taking these technical terms, getting it into this like outreach message, and then being able to have some metrics to show back to EPA to show that we're actually doing this was really important. Okay. Um, Eric, I'm on the slide now where we talk about the, the survey. Do you want to chime in about that? Sure. Um, so um, we've conducted three surveys as part of this campaign, and we started with the baseline survey. And um, the idea there is that we were just going to get a handle on um, where residents are currently, because if we don't know where they are, we can't really um, – um, tailor the message and the targeting to their needs. And so um, what you see there is the slides that show um, where the survey was conducted. Each dot represents sort of a, uh, tells you approximately how many individuals from that location are participating in the survey. And we did the survey online, and that's very important because when we went around back and did the follow-up survey, we were able to show them the actual video that was running and ask them if they recalled seeing it. So we didn't have to add in a telephone survey. You can only you know, tell people stuff and ask, ask them to react to the information. And there are certain advantages to a telephone survey, but then there are consequences as well because there's no visual uh, information there. So in the beginning of the first round of advertising in 2018, we did the baseline online survey of residents in the parts of Massachusetts that are, um, you know, urbanized and covered by the MS4 permit. So, Carrie, let's go on to the next slide. Um, and here's the top highlights that came out of that. So, um, uh, this will probably not surprise too many of you here on the line. Um, Massachusetts residents told us that they tend to perceive water pollution as something that's caused by corporations, and then the federal government, the EPA, gets involved and does something about it. They're just not as likely to recognize that it's a local problem with local solutions and that their local government is involved. And the uh, rubber ducky video and kind of the themes around Think Blue are all designed to address that. Another thing that's really important to understand is that we found very low knowledge of uh, stormwater concepts and terminology. If you just use the same information with residents that you're using amongst yourselves, they're just not going to get it. And because they don't get it, it's not going to be urgent. And I think most of you have experienced this at one point or another. Now, a really important finding that shaped the way that we chose to distribute our messages is the last one. Um, about half of the residents tell us they are able to follow what's going on with their local government through the news media or uh, social media. News media or social media, about half are getting information about their local government that way. 
but only one out of 10 told us that they would pick up literature at a local government office. And of course, the uh, variety of literature that's available at the typical local government office is extensive. So that's not one out of 10 people that are picking up stormwater literature. That's one out of 10 residents that are picking up any kind of literature. So it's really easy to distribute literature at your office, but it's not very effective at all. So Carrie, if we go on to the next slide. So accounting for that, um, we created the Think Blue campaign. And of course, as all modern campaigns go these days, kind of the anchor of the campaign is the website and you see it there. And the rubber ducky video is featured on the website. And between the 2018 and the 2019 campaigns, we actually updated that video. The first video we were working with came from 2001 in uh, San Diego. And as our other panelists may have mentioned, uh, we actually had the first uh, electronic version was digitized from a VHS tape and the video quality was very poor. It looked terrible on a big screen. Um, so between 2018 and 2019, we reshot the video using modern high definition cameras and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's available on the website along with a lot of other stormwater information. Now, if you go on to slide 24, here's how we targeted that ad. We aimed it at the residents in the, that were represented, that are in communities represented by a municipal stormwater uh, coalition uh, participating municipality. So any municipality that had joined the statewide coalition or their regional coalition and was an active participant, we advertised in those communities. Works out to about 4 million people, and that's about 60% of the population of Massachusetts. And you may ask, why didn't we just advertise everywhere? There's a certain amount of stormwater everywhere. Well, what we're trying to do is stretch our dollars as far as they'll go. And so what you see here in 2018, our advertising budget worked out to about 2.8 cents for each resident. And then when we went back around in 2019, it worked out to about 2.5 cents for each resident. So all of the results that I'm about to share with you, what we accomplished, were with less than three cents per person. And at, at, in a campaign of this nature, it's really just once you reach a certain point, the more you spend, the more you get. And 2.9 cents doesn't seem like a lot of money to get people's attention and try and impart some kind of educational message to them. But when you consider how many millions of people were trying to reach at that amount, the uh, advertising budget seems large if you just look at the dollars, but small if you divide those dollars by how many people have to be reached. So even with less than three cents a resident, we were able to demonstrate some measurable, meaningful accomplishments. So going on to the next slide, Carrie. First off, uh, we reached almost two million people with that amount. So we didn't reach all four million with that amount, but we reached almost half of them with that amount, that's the yellow line across the bottom, about half the money went out on Facebook and about half the money went out on YouTube. And they saw the ad an average of 4.3 times each. So we reached about half the population, a little more than four times each with those, uh, with those dollars. So now on slide 26, um, we were able afterwards to provide detailed reporting on how that money was spent. And this is really important when you consider how that, how the permits are structured in Massachusetts, because each municipality has its own permit, each um, municipality has a permit directly with the EPA, and the burden of reporting what's been accomplished is municipality by municipality. Now they have clear permission as part of their permit language to be a member of these kinds of campaigns, but they're not off the hook for their individual reporting back to EPA on what they did or didn't do. So we were able to take the advertising results that we got and break them out municipality by municipality. So let's go on to the next slide, Carrie, where you can see those reports. So Facebook and Google tell us how many impressions that we got in each area. And using a little black voodoo 
magic and information that's available about the population in these areas, we were able to provide a valid estimate of how many times each ad ran on Facebook and in YouTube in each of the cities giving each participating city a clear, reportable accomplishment for both fiscal year 18, fiscal year 19, and fiscal year 2020. So we've get, we helped all of them create clear, measurable benchmarks of what was accomplished in each, uh, in each fiscal year, town by town. And we were able to do that because when we advertise online, we get very precise numbers about how often the video was seen. When you use conventional methods like cable access television and cable television and broadcast television, you just don't get these kinds of metrics. Anything that's digital is much more measurable than anything that's print, broadcast, or analog in any way. So we have a much better sense of what we would be accomplishing using these methods than if we just put something on HBO or CNN or Fox News or any of any of those things. So each each municipality that has actively raised their hand and joined one of their regional stormwater coalitions got this kind of a report at no cost to them. So let's go on to slide 28. And uh, so what did it accomplish? Other than meeting a permit requirement, what did we accomplish with our advertising campaign? And here you can see that at 2.9 cents a resident, a meaningful number of them saw the ad often enough that they remembered it. And so this is our uh, 2018 and our 2019, 2020 campaigns. The red campaign is the campaign that was using the older version of the video. And the blue bars on the chart are the ones that were using the newer version of the video. And so what you see is in 2018 with the old, um, uh, with the old video, 8% remembered seeing it. And in 2019, with the new version of the video, uh, more than 15% remembered seeing it. So there's a clear improvement uh, from one year to the next, which we got by reshooting the video, even though we actually spent less money per person in, in 2019. So going on to the next slide, uh, Carrie. Um, did the video make a difference? Yes, it did. Here's what we can see. And again, this is at a very small advertising purchase per resident. But what we see is that if you compare those who remembered seeing the video to those who didn't remember seeing it, they were much more likely to recognize that stormwater <clears throat> has a major impact on waterways than those who didn't see it. It's just that simple. If they saw the video, if they remembered the video, they were more likely to agree that stormwater pollution is a major problem for waterways. And on slide 30, um, if they saw the video and they remembered the video, they were also more likely to correctly remember that stormwater goes untreated into rivers, lakes, and streams compared to those who didn't see the video and didn't remember it. These differences are meaningful, they're measurable, and given how little we could afford to spend on a person-by-person -person basis, they're really not bad. So, Carrie, let's go on to the site that shows the website. Now, um, the video is great, and we had got good results for the investment, and we were able to provide each participating municipality with a report of what was accomplished, and that's all terrific. But the content of the video, it's a short video, isn't able to meet each and every permit requirement. So uh, no matter how well we did with our video, the participating municipality still had some work that they had to do on their own. And so that's where the website comes in. And we created a section on that website. You can see it there with the red box around it for MS4 communities. And this is where we gave each participating municipality the other stuff that they needed to meet their permit requirements. And if you go on to slide to the next slide, Carrie, um, here's another view of that page. And what you see is it's basically a long list of downloads. No surprise, it's uh, a long list of useful materials that we created for each municipality that they could then download and distribute. 
along with some guidance about how you would measure and document your distribution efforts so that you can meet the permit requirements that are not covered by the video. We would do everything on behalf of all the municipalities if it was in any way feasible for us to do that, but it's just not. So we tried to do the next best thing is to just give everybody a kit that they could pull out the kit, follow the instructions, and feel confident that they had uh, covered what they needed to cover on the education and outreach side of their permit. So going on to the next slide, Carrie, there you can see that um, you know, you'll recall from what she was saying that each permit um, had the required audiences and the materials that we prepared for each of the municipalities were organized that way, audience by audience. Um, so it's very easy for a municipality or municipal stormwater manager to visit the website, grab the stuff, use the stuff and then report on using the stuff the way that EPA was expecting to see it. Um, going on to the next slide. Um, we did a survey of municipal stormwater managers in Massachusetts, and one of the things that they told us is that even though the permit clearly authorizes them to use third-party materials, it's overtly explicitly permitted for them to do that, some of them were uncomfortable distributing materials that didn't have their municipal logo on it. So all of the materials that we prepared as part of the campaign, we did it using regular Microsoft Office products. We used uh, Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, so that if a municipality felt that they needed to add their logo, they would be able to do so. So all of the materials are customizable by each uh, municipality. Going on to the next slide, here's a couple of examples. Now, everyone knows that stormwater problems are hard to explain verbally and even kind of hard to explain sometimes with a photograph. And so for that reason, we used a lot of infographics. We had graphic designers create uh, do and don't style images, clearly demonstrating the proper behavior with regards to stormwater and improper behavior with regards to stormwater. On the right there, you see a gas station, and uh, we're showing what best practices look like in place on a gas station with the little call-out bubbles that um, explain in very briefly each item. Our, our goal here is to make each of the materials as accessible as possible for the end user. Now we had a few other things that we were able to accomplish in, in 2018 and 2019. So um, what you see there on the next slide uh, are some newspaper ads that we prepared and ran in different formats. Going on to the next slide, for, uh, for a very small amount of money, we were able to run a billboard in uh, Boston. And um, uh, going on to the next slide, um, Many municipalities enjoy doing public events. They've got their Earth Day event, they've got their Arbor Day event, they've got their town fair, their county fair, all these kinds of public events, and they want to be able to do stormwater education and outreach at their events. So we created a table tent, as you can see here. So any, just about any table can be turned into a think blue kiosk, and there's some rubber ducky giveaways and that sort of thing. We created a set of those materials for our regional stormwater partners uh, to be loaned out to participating municipalities as necessary. And that's how the campaign ran in 2019 and 2018. And we got our fingers crossed that we'll be able to do some more good work in 2020. And that, I think, brings us to the Q&A part of the program. Sounds good. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us and for powering through. I know you've had some uh, technical things going on today. Um, we have a couple of questions that, that I think are great and creative and know nothing about. So uh, one of the questions is, have you thought about TikTok or Snapchat videos to get out the message to maybe a different audience than those who are on Facebook and YouTube? Um, so there are any number of options that are available for distributing video content. Um, and of course, you can run as many different campaigns as you have dollars. 
We chose Facebook and YouTube because they reach the largest audiences. So we were able to reach the most people for the least amount of PR consultant time. Um, you know, if we ran campaigns on Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Snapchat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, a much larger portion of the advertising budget would end up getting consumed with uh, administration and the, you know, the amount of money being spent on actually putting the video in front of eyeballs would go down. Um, if at such a time we start to see that um, Facebook's market share slips or YouTube's market share slips and some of the emerging rivals are grabbing significant portions of the market share, then, you know, that would be something that we would reevaluate. But the decision to just use the two largest was about stretching our budget as far as it could go. Maine has a very similar approach and thought process as to what Eric described. Um, and in addition, um, for almost all of our education and outreach, the audiences that we're trying to reach are all um, adults at least 25 and older. And um, multiple studies have found that for those age groups, they're using Facebook and YouTube as their primary sources and they're not so much on um, the Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, those other um, up and coming platforms. So once those, um, the demographics that are using those platforms kind of age into our target audience age range, then we might look to um, start moving into those platforms, or there will probably be some new platform that hasn't even been created yet that will take its place. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to add is that for Maine, um, we're reaching a lot of our younger demographics um, through school programs. Um, so we, instead of putting ads in front of um, like teenagers and young adult faces, we try to reach them by doing um, like actual stormwater lessons or field trips or uh, programs like that on college campuses and then in schools. Awesome, thank you for that. Um... Also, a note to everybody who is listening in, uh, we still have time for questions. I see a fair number of them still rolling in, but I would love to hear from as many of you as have questions or comments or uh, even insights on how this is working in your state, kind of similar programs. So the next question that I have is about uh, kind of successful strategies for overcoming barriers um, so posting on Facebook, whether it's through uh, your kind of organizational approval systems or security efforts uh, related to sponsored posts or uh, kind of any of the, the strategies that you found to overcome the barriers that you come across. Eric, do you want to go first? Well, uh, part of the reason that the statewide coalition elected to use an outside agency like WaterWords is um, for that purpose. We certainly know from our work that for many of the municipalities, social media is a challenge and there are, there may not be a person who's clearly assigned and the stormwater manager may not have access to the accounts directly and um, the, they may be blocked from using social media while they're uh, using their office computers. And unfortunately, the, the kind of challenges that are arise, they come up municipality by municipality. So there's not kind of a obvious one size fits all solution to the challenges that many of the stormwater managers that we're trying to serve would find in their community, which is why we sought to do as much as we could on their behalf and give them the data that they could report. Um, I, I know from some of the information that has come our way that some of the individual municipalities have struggled with some of the, uh, to make use of some of the social media materials that we've provided, but there's really not a simple answer from at least where I sit <clears throat> to deal with that issue. 
Yeah, so in Maine, um, the, part of the reason why our MS4 communities have clustered into the four stormwater working groups is for that exact reason. Um, it was to cost share amongst all of the education and outreach tasks that they needed to accomplish. And also so that there was basically like one slash four people in the state um, kind of doing everything. Um, so it was a lot easier to coordinate with just a few people working on it um, as opposed to everyone in the state doing it. Um, the Bangor Area Stormwater Working Group has actually hired a marketing firm to just do all of their online um, and print everything. So all of their materials, all of their social media platforms, all of their um, creations, and a lot of their out, uh, event management as well. Um, their marketing firm does that. And then um, for the other stormwater working groups in Maine, um, the facilitators do all of the social media management. Um, so like for the group that I manage, I do all of the Facebook posts. We did all of the authorizations and everything like that. So we run all, um, so all the municipalities in, in our local stormwater working group, they pay a portion in and um, that all gets pooled to go towards those efforts. And then we give them the information that they need for their annual reports. And then I also make sure that when I put a post on social media that's specific to one of the municipalities, which is one of the things that we have to do for our permit, um, I make sure to give them all of the links um, and information and they're tagged in the post. I try to connect them um, in many as many ways as possible so that they can share it, boost it, um, and amplify it through their channels as well. So there's a lot of cross-pollination that ends up happening. Awesome, thank you for that, Ali. Um, here's another uh, kind of interesting question that goes back to some of the earlier conversations. Um, and people, here's somebody who wanted to hear more about the um, kind of survey the, and the process to find out where people were getting information and kind of how you surveyed people and how you gathered information about your demographics. So for the online survey, we use the panel service when they are responsible for recruiting individuals who meet whatever requirements we define. So we can recruit individuals from a very wide range of um, walks of life. And then, you know, the harder they are to find, the more we have to pay for them is basically what it boils down to. So for this campaign, um, we clustered the municipalities into their counties and we purchased adults in those counties. And then we chose the balance to census option, which means that the demographics of the survey takers are, are chosen to closely reflect the uh, demographics as the census tells us would be in those communities. Yeah, and this is Karen. I'm going to chime in. Um, at the statewide coalition, everybody was like, well, we have our own distro list. We can do a survey. Why don't we save the money and just send it out to our distribution list and get the results then? And um, water words at work were like, you know, then you're basically kind of hitting like an echo chamber. Like they're on your distribution list because they already care about this stuff. You know, and we discovered that if we had done that approach, we wouldn't have gotten the real results of trying to understand what the general public meant. So spending the money and outsourcing it um, got us better results. Thank you, Carrie. I think that's a really important point of kind of a lot of what I think is really cool about the work that you've done is precisely that getting beyond the echo chamber and really getting to a point where you're reaching people who have no idea what stormwater means and don't think about this every day for their jobs. Um, like all of us on this call. Um, so they, thank you for that point. Um, another uh, question about uh, 
targeting people who are in the area kind of more temporarily. So have you tried anything or thought about anything that targets uh, tourists or visitors uh, to the area? Yeah, so uh, Facebook and a lot of the other platforms, um, you can pinpoint locations or you can stay within city limits or within X number of miles from um, like the center of town. Um, and so for a lot of the platforms, it's they don't have to say that they live there. They can be passing through and Facebook, if they're on um, that platform when they're in that area, um, it will show up on their device. So there are ways that you can set up your ads um, to hit people who are just passing through as opposed to people who are there day in and day out. Cool, thank you. I was gonna um, joke that everybody from Massachusetts just goes to Maine to vacation anyway, so we hit everybody up. Um, <laughs> can confirm. But yes, it works they, out. They no, we, um, yeah, we, we, we had some discussions and that's why we're really excited about this regional concept. I mean, that's one of the things that keeps coming up is like when you go from one place to the other, it should be the same message. Um, one of the challenges that keeps coming up for us is not necessarily like tourists and visitors, but um, language barriers. Um, we have a lot of different demographics in Massachusetts, especially in the urbanized areas that have the permits. And um, some of our regional groups have done some great research on how to do that. And that's why we really focus on like the infographics because you don't really have to know English that well to understand them. Um, but that's been a big challenge that we've been trying to figure out is how to break that language barrier. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, that's a, a good point of, I, I know that in some places like out in California, they've, I've seen it translated into Spanish, but often with kind of less information uh, just because of translation issues. So the idea of how you reach everybody is a really, really good question. Um, speaking of, reaching everybody in a question that's related to the earlier TikTok question, but um, for a more mainstream at this point uh, platform, uh, was there any thought about using Twitter for this as well? Well, again, um, Twitter is an important platform. A lot of politicians use it. A lot of journalists use it but its share of the market and the eyeballs that it can reach compared to Facebook and YouTube is much, much smaller. So in the uh, interest of keeping uh, my billable hours down and spending dollars to reach people in Massachusetts, uh, we declined to use Twitter for that reason. That makes sense. Yeah, Maine had a similar thought process. Um, Twitter just doesn't seem to be an appropriate platform um, just based on how our programs are set up and the staff that we have available. Um, Twitter is like a very in the moment type of platform. Um, and one of the many perks of Facebook and some of the other platforms is you can like schedule things to just go out and you don't have to be at your desk hitting the actual like publish button. Um, so that's Another reason why we haven't used Twitter um, for a lot of our outreach is we just don't have the capacity to kind of be on there being like, right now, stormwater events or stormwater coming to you. Um, we like to use the, the kind of more steady planned um, approaches that allow us to also kind of just post something in the moment if needed. Yeah. I will say that um, we do have a Think Blue Massachusetts Twitter account. It was set up after this campaign and um, it was set up by interns. So trying to, we reached out because it's social media and the younger generation gets it better. So we did have some um, students working on a project and they helped us set it up. But um, like Allie and Eric said, it's not as effective as our other um, platforms. Our budget was generous enough to accomplish the results that you see, but um, you know there's more that could be done if there was more to um, more available to work with. But you know, 
for the cost that it would take to set up and run a campaign on a new platform and all those hours, that would eat into our 2.9 cents or 2.5 cents per resident. And, you know, our, our, our vision with this campaign to provide the best service to the statewide coalition is to send as much of the dollars out to actually reaching residents, actually getting beyond the echo chamber as possible and to, you know, spend as, as little of it on consultants as possible, frankly. Great. Uh, so it looks like we have a little bit more time. Um, we had somebody who had a question uh, about the kind of nested working group permit, uh, interlocal working group uh, structure. And so I was wondering if, Ali, if you could explain how that works for you guys in Maine. Yeah. Um, so all of our nested MS4s are uh, geographically located um, within the clusters. Um, so the municipalities that those nested MS4s are in are also MS4 communities. So it just um, made a lot of sense for them to be at the table just because they already have to work with that municipality that they're operating within. Um, and then based on how our permit is set up for the municipalities and the nesteds, um, by having the nesteds participate with the municipalities in the stormwater working groups, um, the state gives them a lot of credit for the education and outreach efforts that the clusters do collectively. Um, so it helps them reduce their costs because um, they can just chip in to the cluster general fund and then they get credit for everything that happens within the cluster. Um, so everybody has found it really beneficial <laughs> um, for them to participate. And then um, a lot of the nesteds, especially um, the universities, they uh, actually have a lot to contribute back to the municipalities um, in terms of uh, free interns. Um, potential staff at those municipalities, um, and then just lots of volunteer manpower um, and time and effort as well. So um, all of the stormwater working groups have found that they benefit a lot by having the nesteds included in their, um, in their efforts. Great. There's been a lot of really great questions. Uh, I'm going to keep it open uh, for questions for a couple more minutes. Uh, I know many of you have to head out to other commitments. I do want to let you know uh, this recording of the webinar will be online uh, hopefully tomorrow. Uh, we'll see uh, definitely by Monday and I will send everybody a link to that and other resources uh, as soon as it is live. So uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm going to put the link to uh, our website, uh, the newapix.org, but newapix is hard to spell, so I will put that up on the screen as soon as GoToWebinar uh, is ready to switch screens with me. Hang on for just a moment. Uh, but yeah, that, that website uh, is also will also be linked in the information that I send out uh, once the recording is live. Um, hold on, there we go. Um, so the link should be on your screen right now. Uh, there's a, a, a shortened version there that will bring you straight to the archives that have previous webinar recordings. Uh, and if you scroll up on that page, we'll have information about upcoming webinars. We'll also have information there about uh, ways to apply to be our next presenter. So uh, stay tuned for that. And as always, please reach out to me with any questions. Uh, you will have my email address very soon when I send you all an email uh, with more information. So last call for questions. Okay, well, thank you so much to Carrie Reed, Eric Eckel, and Allie Clift 
for uh, sharing so much with us today. Uh, and it looks like we're all good to go on to the rest of our days. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.